sounding crisis. The research project on climate change and sound. Is part of the Energies Consciousness Reading Group, which is part of the research project Sounding Crisis at the University of Copenhagen. The reading group meets since January 2022 once a month to discuss core texts of the emerging fields of energies and environmental humanities. Thus, the members of the reading group aim at becoming more aware of alternative notions of energies instead of the still predominant concept of energy based on fossil fuel. So far, our guests were Anders Svensson, professor in physics of ice, climate and earth at the University of Copenhagen, Dominic Boyer, one of the founding members of the Energy Humanities and professor of anthropology at Rice University in Houston, Texas, and Jake McGinsky, a US American composer and filmmaker who also directed the impressive documentary Milford Graves Full Mentis about the famous jazz drummer and modern shaman who was McGinsky's former teacher and mentor. To the fourth session of the Energy's Consciousness Lecture, it's our great pleasure to welcome today Shelley Trauer, who is joining us from London. Hi, Shelley, welcome. Thank you, hello. <laughs> hello, it's wonderful having you. And um, yeah, I will now introduce you quickly before I will hand it over to you for an introduction to your book, which is at the core of today's um, meeting. So Shelley Trauer is professor of English literature and a founding member of the Climate Network at the University of Roehampton in London in the United Kingdom. Although originally trained as a literary scholar, Shelley has a long-standing interest in sound, which feeds into her work in oral history and literature. She was the principal investigator of the A. HRC funded project Memories of Fiction and Oral History of Readers' Life Stories and Living Libraries. Her next monograph, which is forthcoming with Oxford University Press in 2022, has the title Sound Writing, Voices, Authors and Readers of Oral History. So maybe we will talk about that too. But of course, um, the reason why we invited Shelley is because her interest in oral history and ghosts and her interest and concern about the environment um, dates not only back to her work in the research project Mysticism, Myth and Celtic Nationalism at the University of Exeter. It also goes back to her outstanding monograph, Senses of Vibration, A History of the Pleasure and Pain of Sound, which was published 2012 with Bloomsbury. It is this book here. And um, was not only shortlisted for the British Society for Literature and Science Book Prize, but also listed as a sensory studies book of note. We read and discussed parts of Shelley's impressive senses of vibration in our reading group because vibrations are the natural science phenomena in which sound and energy collide. It was the first book to take the material experience of vibration as central, offering an interdisciplinary history of the phenomenon and its reverberation in cultural imagination. In her monograph, Shelley tracks vibrations through the work of a wide range of writers, including physiologists, physicists, and spiritualists, as well as poets and novelists from Coleridge to Dickens and Wells. So Shelley will now at first give a short in, uh, introduction um, to her book and her interest in the topic of vibration. And then all participants of this Zoom session are invited to join our discussion. You just can write questions in the chat or raise your hand, of course. So dear Shelley, please, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for inviting me along. Um, as you mentioned, Senses of Vibration, which I also have here, um, was published 10 years ago, about 2012. Um, and it feels like a good moment to reflect back, actually, and, and for myself as well, to think, what have I done since and how does that connect? And yeah, um, I think it's a, a good moment to look back. Um, so yeah, I've done other projects since like oral history projects. I've worked on a nationalist project about nationalism um, and they're often quite distinct. I haven't 
it's kind of always traced a continuity through, but those interests in sound do keep popping up in, in different ways through my work. Um, but yeah, looking back from here at, at senses of vibration, I, it strikes me that it was a, a really difficult topic to tackle because it was everywhere in the 19th century. It seemed to be um, from physics, where the physicists were saying that the universal energies vibrate all the time through the atmosphere, uh, atoms vibrate, so the whole matter vibrates, but also the idea that our human nerves vibrate, physiologists and psychologists saying that vibrations deliver sensations to the brain. So vibrations become kind of the basis of consciousness and of who we are. So they're, they're everywhere from deep inside, like who we are to, to out there in the universe. And I, I kind of remember feeling completely overwhelmed when I started to realize this and, and think how on earth do we trace a way through this in, in the linear path that is a book. Um, how do I order all of this? Um, I'm going to share my screen actually because I've got the contents pages there and it's kind of like a, a, a kind of map through. So it strikes me now that, uh, yeah, that we have the, the disciplinary emergence of vibration through, to begin with the nerves, so through physiology and psychology um, beginning around 1750 through to later in the 19th century. Um, yeah, the, these nervous motions, so the, the um, origins in, in writers like David Hartley around 1750 uh, of this idea that our, our nerves vibrate and this is the basis of sensation and consciousness. Um, and then romantic poets taking that up. And the idea that some people are especially sensitive, especially nervous, that their nerves are especially able to kind of receive vibrations to the extent that some poets and some sensitive people will tremble. They'll almost make those vibrations physically manifest in their bodies. Um, so yeah, all of that comes in as the first chapter, partly because that started historically, it seemed to me earlier than some of the later ideas in physics about universal energies. But that's where I go next with chapter two, with the uh, psychophysics and, and physics and the idea, ideas emerging about um, light and heat as vibratory energies that turn into each other, uh, that are transmitted and transformed rather than created and destroyed as per the first law of thermodynamics, the law of conservation of energy. So, um, and there's connection. So, some of the spiritualists took those ideas up and thought that our nervous vibrations therefore are transmitted and transformed rather than destroyed, that, that vibrations go on forever, if you like. So as well as being everywhere in space, everywhere um, within and without us, um, the idea that these vibrations kind of carry on infinitely. Um, so that's, that leads into spiritualism. It became a core premise of spiritualist ideas that our nervous vibrations also can carry on beyond our death and that you just have to be a very attuned sensitive person with those sensitive nerves to pick it up to pick up those vibrations um so yeah that maps out the first two chapters then i got into the technologies uh, from wires to radio waves from railways to the vibrator um, all different ways in which technologies that around this time as well were propagating and channeling these vibrations in different ways. And it, it felt like they're all interconnected and it was just really hard to trace that path through. Um, so nerves, for example, then are likened to wires and nerves and wires seems kind of interchangeable. Um, so yeah, it kind of, some of the themes continue throughout, but I tried to map it out in this in this way. Uh, also, we have, as we can see here, it's kind of bad vibrations, dangerous vibrations and good vibrations. So pathological motions like railway shock, the idea that these palpable vibrations that we experience on trains can do all kinds of terrible things to our minds and bodies. There was a lot of concern about that in medical journals in the 19th century. Um, but also the idea that some kinds of vibrations are actually very good for you, that early versions of the vibrator, like the percuteur, for example, could be uh, amazingly beneficial to people's health. Um, so yeah, I think the, the message here is there were 
loads of vibrations everywhere um forever and there's very bad ones very dangerous ones very good ones um so that kind of is a, a very very quick overview of that book um and these vibrations although the book really starts around 1750 and finishes around the well in the early 20th century a lot of these ideas continue I think right through the 20th century as well and I my second project really my second monograph really uh in many ways was completely distinct had a completely different starting point I was thinking about regional kinds of nationalism but vibrations do crop up here as well including um some of these those ideas about spiritualist vibrations spiritual vibrations um so for example in D.H. Lawrence's work we see uh ideas of rocks as containing kind of ancestral energies and similarly in, in new age environmental writing later on there's this idea this nationalist idea that ancient ancestors somehow their energies are still there inhabiting these primitive rocks and that natives can tune into them and I, I see that as very problematic as well it can be an exclusive kind of nationalist thinking where other people from outside cannot do that um but yeah this idea that certain inhabitants of Cornwall which is my case study for this kind of nationalist thinking um, that certain inhabitants of Cornwall can connect with these energies. Um, so yeah there's some continuities through my work as well as some differences and I, it struck me when I was looking at these two covers yesterday when I was trying to have a think about how I would do today um, that there's in, in some ways the covers are completely different aren't they the first one has this string with the vibrations yeah it's a, it's a movement it's in flux completely um whereas these rocks are completely solid they're about as unfluxy as, as you can get um as unvibratory as you can get um and the sort of idea there with nationalism is that rocks form this very stable sense of of what a nation is and if you can identify with those rocks in some way somehow your, your, your identity, your national identity, I suppose, is, is very stable as well. But there's all kinds of challenges to that. And in a way, the sea, I'm now thinking actually, the waves of the sea, sometimes they cross borders as well. And I do sometimes think about this in one of the chapters, which one was that? I think the third one with the cliffs of the edge of England, that the rocks can tremble, the sea, kind of plummet, it pummels up the rocks and, and shakes them a bit, but it's also the sounds that people on the cliffs can hear those sounds. And it's a kind of threat to that idea of a national border. So the kind of this very material and the very um, vibratory kind, kind of do, there's something going on there. There's a tension there in that book as well. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think vibrations do continue to radiate out of people when they're dead but I think the idea itself has had a kind of afterlife from the 19th century that is still with us sometimes today. Okay so I think that's all I'm going to say for now to get us started. Um, yeah a bit of a, an, an introduction and an overview of those two books. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, that's um, a wonderful as an, a summary and also the tension I find very interesting. Um, I also had to think right away of another idea from Greenland about ancestors and energies because in Greenland when there is the um, Nordic lights, you probably heard of the very famous phenomena when the sky is turning in different colors. It's the idea that the ancestors play soccer with the heads of the deceased too. Okay. Okay. Um, so it's also a kind of a vibration thing that's uh, active there related to radio energy too. So, um, but it's not the connection to the rocks um, because it's in the sky, but 
I was wondering if you maybe could tell us a little bit more about um, the background, how you actually came up with the idea of writing on um, vibrations a book. Is it really the result from your research on Celtic uh, um, nationalism? Or is it also related to, as you mentioned it in your book at the beginning, your experience of the London club scene? So, <laughs> which is also a totally different um, origin, maybe than the Celtic mysticism and uh, nationalism. So yeah, what inspired you actually to um, take up the challenge of writing such a book about vibrations and focusing on the phenomenon of vibrations from a um, history of science and technology perspective? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was really the clubs in London and pubs and that sense of music at the time being very bassy. Um, so I'm, I'm actually from Cornwall and I'd been in bands and played guitar a bit and, and all that kind of music. Um, but I, I was also going to some, what did they used to call them? Big kind of raves or whatever, um, free parties and things. And it was a completely different, a much more palpable experience. Um, that kind of bassy dance music, which you can absolutely feel. Um, very very different from the kinds of band music that I was also taking part in and then I moved to London and kind of yeah did more of that and went to pubs and you could just feel it all the time everywhere a lot of different kinds of music venues uh, there's the one I think I mentioned in Senses of Vibration Fabric where they actually sort of designed the floor so the it's speakers and you walk on it and it vibrates um, and it really music was and still is often completely designed to vibrate you and not just be heard. I think that's com completely, it felt completely evident a lot of the time. Um, so, and I was going to write my PhD about contemporary musical environments as they featured in literature. Um, and somehow I kind of got from there to thinking about the vibrations, but thinking about sound as vibration. Um, looking at a bit of physics and then finding myself in Helmholtz's work in the 19th century and starting to get this sense that he wasn't just writing about sound, he was writing about all these other kinds of energies and vibrations, like his book on sensations of tone published, I think in 1862, and kind of thinking, what on earth is this? And I think he even mentions railways somewhere in there <laughs> and, and, and nerves and yeah. So that was sort of this inkling that there was something bigger going on and then I, I suppose I kind of got very distracted and started reading around more and following some of his footnotes and I, I credit my supervisor I think holding his nerve a bit because my PhD seemed to completely swerve <laughs> um, into the 19th century from the contemporary period um, and finding vibrations everywhere and feeling pretty overwhelmed by that and looking at Fechner and all these 19th century scientists and psychologists and everything um, and it very much became a, a PhD really about literature and science because vibrations are everywhere. You find yourself one minute in physics and then in physiology and there's all those disciplines feel very, very linked and connected because they're in formation at the time actually, aren't they? As is literature, they, they weren't distinct disciplines. They were emerging. Um, so yeah, that, that I, I cross over a lot between literature and science, which I do again actually in Rocks of Nation, but quite differently there, I'm looking at geology a lot and, and literature. Um, so, and as I say, yeah, but some of those ideas continue through my later work. And then I got involved in oral history, which is completely, I do have a bit of a habit of just kind of starting somewhere else and then seeing how I might go back and make a connection. So oral history was completely by accident. I just got a job after my PhD doing oral history projects. Um, and then eventually I start thinking, oh, okay, you know, this is sound. <laughs> this is, this is something going on here. I, can, I got, I was particularly sensitive to the fact that these interviews aren't just what people say, which is what most oral historians tend to focus on. It's not just the content of what people say, but how people say it, the ways they say it, the voice, the sound of the voice. I was also really fascinated by the accidental sounds. So dogs barking or an airplane overhead or, all of that kind of thing. Um, and then eventually I end up with my next book, which is going, it's going to be called Sound Writing. So I'm thinking, in a way, it feels like the beginning of that is the last chapter of Senses of Vibration, which I never actually quite wrote because then I'm thinking about sound recording and how those vibrations get imprinted into 
wax and tin foil in the first in Edison's inventions and then continues on from there. So yeah, that's a kind of brief history of my of my project, I think. Yeah, that's wonderful. And it's um, really um, interesting. I think it when you look at it or what you just mentioned about the last 10 years, it's of course, um, it makes sense how things are connected from your background with music and your own uh, connection to Cornwall or spiritual traditions. Um, but the interesting thing is that you were recommended as or this book was recommended to us um, highly from Douglas Kahn, a scholar in Australia who has specialized in science and from there moved to um, energy studies. And um, we, of course, saw that for our energy um, consciousness reading room, it makes totally sense to look at vibrations. But was this the, the topic of energy studies or energy humanities actually occurred also after your book uh, was published? So it started around 2012, 14, something. Um, and so it was your book, You wrote actually uh, before energy studies and energy humanities became um, a topic. And so, of course, you are not probably, uh, it's not a topic for you that explicitly. But I was wondering where you also thinking sometimes about energies or what do you think about um, an idea to think energies and to do this with the help of thinking vibrations, for example? Do you see there a connection or something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, as you say, it's 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 a newer field um, and I'm not very acquainted with it, but I, I think it is interesting. I, I'm keen to explore possible connections there. Um, one thing that strikes me is, is those spiritualist types of energy, uh, those ideas of energy that as if energy is infinite and it can, is just infinite supply. Um, it, it seems kind of almost the opposite in a way because energy is a far, and energies are finite and um, very material that energy humanities is, is concerned isn't it I think primarily with kind of well spiritual energies are okay. definitely a topic too okay. I would think yeah <laughs> okay interesting yeah um, yeah um Because well, maybe what's also interesting for you is that we also read um, texts from indigenous people or we are okay. interested in an indigenous notion of um, energy's um, intimacy. And um, that is something that probably also Jenny could tell more about as she's uh, in uh, conversation already with an Australian scholar who um, has developed, Jenny, would you like to tell a little bit about Andrew Belletti's research and his- Oh uh, yeah, I actually was just talking to him today and I mentioned you, so I think he knows of you. <laughs> so he wrote a PhD. I don't know how far it circulated beyond it. I, I know that Douglas Kahn suggested it to me when I was, I guess maybe I had read about uh, the energy's intimacies by that point, I'm not quite sure, uh, idea, by Warren Carew, um, but Andrew Belletti wrote his PhD called um, Listening, um, to, Listening country. to Country. It's it's um, in, he was like in one of the first um, uh, Aboriginal bands, although he is of, he's from, he is of, in, of Indian descent, but, um, but yeah, he's done this work with people for 30 years um, like collaborative projects with different um, indigenous collaborators. Um, so he has gotten into storytelling a lot, um, but also about how the sensory um, apparatus for listening is is beyond even the senses. It's the com combination of the senses, but also like tasting and hearing blood through the earth. I mean, it's like, you know, it's language that's hard for me to, fully access, but but Andrew Belletti is is using or is using these stories um, to describe this different mode of listening. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Which also can be described as an energy intimacy that is the 
a very intimate relationship that indigenous people have to their um, surrounding or their environment. And that um, is also the vibrations of the place somehow, isn't it? Jenny? I don't know. I'm still learning. I, don't, I wouldn't want to speak, for, you know, it's not my area of specialty, mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, there's just, it does have, it's obviously completely different geographically and culturally and everything, but it, it does remind me of some of the Cornish sort of Cornish nationalist writings and the idea that you can tune into the land and ancestors and, and things. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to explore. Totally, yeah. I think it's it's interesting that there seem to be in very different regions of the world similar phenomena. So, yeah. But I also would love to open the discussion, or um, it's a conversation we are actually aiming here at. Um, so, if there are comments and questions from the audience, uh, you are very welcome to join in and um, also to report about your reading experiences. Um, but besides that, um, so yeah, whenever you have questions, then just uh, please come in and um, tell us what you think. But I was also wondering another, um, someone you also mentioned in your book is Jane Bennett, and you have worked with her too, I think, with Vibrant Matter. That was one of the books that is also, um, yeah, important or inspirational for um, energy studies and um, new materialism. Um, so I was wondering if you would maybe talk a little bit later about her. And now I see that Jenny Shepard has raised her hand. So I would love to take you in first, Jenny. But I think Jane Bennett is someone who could we also could talk on later. Yeah. So Jenny. Oh, well, I mean, if you if that's something you wanted to talk about now, Shelley, that's also fine. I could I wait. Want. No, it's okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I was, this is a really general question, but I just, what, what kinds of, um, what, what kinds of things did you, when you, in your discussions with physicists, you said, or you, you did have some kind of, you did some research into physics within the, the, by the, um, the book that we're discussing, the vibration book, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I was just wondering what kinds of conversation, like, what did you, um, what was sort of the most, uh, informative information about that. I guess I'm just thinking about it because of like um, the sort of work that maybe Karen Barad does around interaction and like these different elements affecting each other, you know, kind of collapsing, you know, actor, receiver or performer audience. Like you were talking about that a bit in the book um, about the collapse of these distinctions, I think um, that, uh, um, that some of the the early people working with vibration were kind of addressing. I'm sorry, I'm now I'm forgetting the name of um, this person. Um, but I guess my main question is, is like, what kinds of things did you get from the the interactions you had with physicists or research into physics? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I think. I didn't get that far with physics anyway. I got kind of, I got into the history of it. So we, I, I quite quickly moved from contemporary physics and trying to grapple with the actual physics of sound to, to get an interested in the history and the discourse, I suppose, around sound and vibration. And I wonder if that's partly because new materialism wasn't kind of there at the time, because this is my PhD, like, yeah. Um, which the book turned into around 2000, 2001 and, and around then. Um, so yeah, I, I quickly got into that whole discursive approach, I think. And Jane Bennett going to, relating to that question as well. I, that was kind of a last minute thing that I put into the introduction. So it was really felt like it was happening, but I, I didn't quite have a chance to engage with it because it was, happening whilst I was finishing my book. Um, 
so although yeah in a way I, I I went quite discursive on the other hand I was feeling quite frustrated with social constructionist and discursive types of approaches and those ideas that reality is constituted through language and all of that which I think some new materialist scholars kind of shared that frustration um I'm not very acquainted with new materialism partly because of the reasons I say and I've gone in other directions since but I think there was a sort of shared frustration with some of that 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 is in my work and and so even though I took a quite discursive approach I am engaging with this material phenomenon that does vibrations do happen in and they did happen all through the 19th century in all these different ways some of them palpable some of them not um I think I've got a bit lost now <laughs> no but it's an approach to physics probably that's also for us very challenging okay. coming from the humanities so how do you deal yeah. as a literary scholar and a humanities a humanities scholar with um yeah these physics topics did they put you off or how did they attract you and how did you engage with them yeah um well I did try and obviously grasp I had to follow what Helmholtz was saying so I needed some kind of ability to grapple with what this stuff really is um on the other hand I think some of it went over my head because I'm looking out for other things I'm looking out for railways or those interconnections and things so I had that kind of literary scholars focus on the language of the text how it was being written the fact that some scientists write a bit of poetry and how do how do the exchanges work between the poetry and the science so I would say back then I didn't engage as much with the physics as I might do now if I'd been writing it equipped with mm. other approaches um yeah yeah and similarly in my second book with geology I, I really to some extent need to understand the geology but then I'm looking at um Humphrey Davy as a geologist but also a poet and also a chemist and and all of that mm -hmm. yeah Wonderful. Well, um, Rolf Goebel has uh, raised his hand. Uh, he's actually a literary scholar, professor for literature, if I'm not mistaken, with a strong interest in sound. Is that right, Rolf? Uh, and what is your question or your comment? Please join the conversation. Yes, thanks for your fascinating talk. Um, you're, you're raising lots of, you know, really interesting issues. And I just want to uh, uh, select one. Um, I'm really interested in your sort of emphasis on the physicality of vibrations in, in sound and presumably lots of other areas of, of human conduct. And I am interested in this because I'm working on auditory resonance right now. Mm -hmm. And I am interested in the notion of resonance because on the one hand, it overlaps it resonates with your term of vibration in the sense that there is some kind of physical energy between you know, the, the, the subject that resonates with other people or objects or arts. But I am also interested in going beyond that sort of materialist sonicity um, I have um we have to mute someone. So yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Well, there were some resonances coming in. <laughs> exactly. Um so so I'm interested in, in, in resonance because it combines physical energy, physical vibration with what I actually come to think of as a, a genuinely metaphysical connection, meaning that the subject through their imagination, through their fantasies and desires, resonates, relates, is attuned with, you know, other people, uh, nature, whatever, on a, on on sort of a dual level, on a physical materialistic level and on a spiritual level, which interestingly enough, you also mentioned. So I wonder if you could sort of comment on, on those kind of things. Hmm. Yeah, I think I, that does, yeah, my, my, my book does that a lot, doesn't it? Doesn't it? It's talking on the one hand about very palpable, very material vibrations, like railway trains or something, but also about these 
metaphysical or spiritual kinds of resonances sometimes uh, by resonance are you thinking is that sympathetic vibration or another kinds of resonance mm -hmm. yeah and they, they seem really intertwined a lot of the time aren't they that sometimes it's a metaphor sometimes like vibrating strings are a metaphor for something more metaphysical um sometimes it's as if you can resonate with something that's materially vibrating but you're not um i'm not sure yeah what quite what i'm trying to say but yeah they, they feel all the, intertwined all the time and i think in rocks of nation actually which i was going to call rocks and ghosts and i still sometimes regret that but i changed it um it's very much about the materiality of rocks as a completely solid thing about as material as material gets in in a sense um but also there's loads of ghosts in it and these spiritual energies and things. Um, what, about, what about the role of the imagination? I mean, you know, if uh, I imagine to be in attunement, to be attuned with something, somebody, um, it is something that I very much feel bodily effectively, mm. but since it's in my fantasy, I'm fantasizing about that attunement, it is not at all uh, based on actual physical energy on actual vibrations. And I am very much interested in that kind of aspect. Because again, if I feel attuned something, it doesn't really matter whether I'm just sort of, you know, imagining it or whether there is physical vibration, it just happens. It, it, is, it is as palpable an experience and as meaningful an experience as actual, you know, vibration that go back to you mentioned Helmholtz and so on. So, so I, I would be interested to hear what, what you think of those things. Yeah, that, that both are, are real, as they're both experienced as real, like whether it's physically measurable as a, an ev with evidence as a scientific phenomenon or, or whether it's completely imagined. Again, I keep thinking about these rocks and, and stone circles and things where people you can feel and see and the rocks are completely there for everyone to experience um, and yet the kinds of spiritual experiences people describe having around them are also completely real to them and I think the rocks almost help to buttress that sense of this being a real thing because those rocks really were around when those ancestors however many hundreds of years ago were around doing whatever they were doing the myths that we have or this this dancing circles or whatever it is that's a reality that people feel they can attune to and the rocks give that a certain mm. palpability i think um no it's it's fascinating i think how yeah something that's completely solid and real can be no less um real to someone as, as something sorry no more real to some someone than, than something that's completely imagined mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, how far are you on with your project, Rolf? Well, I'm, I, I, I published a few things and I'm possibly working on a shorter book. So it's, it's very much a work in progress. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a concept that relates to so many things. I mean, all the arts, especially music in my case, or sound, but also, you know, to visuality. And, and I think you, you mentioned taste, right? I mean, we know that the study of taste is, is the most sort of under, or taste is the most under understudied of all these senses in a, in a, in a cultural perspective. Um, mm. So, so um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really a fascinating subject, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I always forget to unmute myself. <laughs> um, sorry, but I was wondering, yeah, the other uh, big connection is, of course, sound. Also, your, your interest in sound and vibrations, which also Rolf shares that the sound is somehow, um, because that's what we are concerned with in our um, reading group, of course, also is the relationship of sound or in my research project, also the question of, of the relationship of sound and energies and how how they are particular carriers of certain kinds of energies or what kind of energies sound does actually uh, carry. And um, do you see this or what, 
how would you see the connection of sound and vibrations for your research or your interest, Shelley? What is it? What fascinates you about sound so much and the connection to vibrations? I partly it's um, sound is that model for other kinds of vibra vibrations that scientists were trying to understand at the time and trying to explain at the time. So yeah, sound being understood as vibration since antiquity, um, it's it's long been known as a vibratory form. Um, whereas in the 19th century, there's all these other new kinds of vibrations. So sound is there as a, a, a very ancient, well understood phenomenon, um, readily available to help explain all these other kinds. Um, so that's one way sound is is um, really kind of useful and. and again you find it everywhere through science and literature as this explanatory form um but also there is a lot of sound so you often can't separate it can you so if you're on the train for example and you're experiencing those vibrations which were presumably much stronger back then because trains were less what's the word insulated um that you couldn't separate that physical vibration of feeling jolted and shaken from the noise it all kind of is the same experience i think you wouldn't be able to yeah separate them out that's being hearing and being physically shaken it is kind of the same thing they blend into each other so there's a lot of that going on i think as well in in my book that it's not only a model but that it's experienced alongside vibrations other kinds of vibrations all the time in, in lots of different ways um yeah, those are the two things that spring to mind. Just trying to remember. I'm not sure, Rolf, are you raising your hand because you want to say? I'm sorry, yes. no, I, I, I let other people talk. Yeah. First. But, okay, yeah. but uh, then maybe you would like to take down your hand again because ah, it's. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can take it down. Yes. Or because ah, no ah, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, great but feel free to join again the uh, discussion of course every time or even also just uh, jump in people yeah. if you have questions um yeah but this is um of course the question of sound and i think that jenny you also were studying the book with your students um in the sound studies lab at uh the royal art academy in copenhagen weren't you or what was your reading of what were you reading and discussing with your students? Yes, I think it was like I think it was the in introduction in chapter one, and it was yeah, it was in our um, class that was called sonic orientations. Um, so we were dealing with um, expanding, you know, the corporal sort of sensitivity to sound beyond just the notion of the ear. Um, so I mean, I work with deep listening and we have this um which also you know ex I don't know if you're familiar with Pauline Oliveros's deep listening practice but she developed she was a composer who developed um uh different ways to practice listening and sounding and they oftentimes include like listening with the soles of your feet or things like that so um <clears throat> but yeah so I think and people were very um they were very excited to to read your your writing, um, I think, you know, I don't think it was something they have been exposed to um, at the Art Academy. So <laughs> they were really thrilled. Yeah. Nice to hear. <laughs> and we also have in the chat a comment from you, Jenny, that it reminds you listening to Shelley of the concept of sonic fiction and well, Louise was adding something to it. Maybe you want to say it and Louise also. <laughs> yeah, I don't have I don't have that much to say, but the but just the idea, I guess both Rolf and Shelley, there were moments of in your writing in this book, but also Rolf, what you're saying about sound being able to kind of suggest concepts or suggest imaginaries that don't exist. And that's also something that that Pauline Oliveros worked with in her practice of deep listening, but also in sonic fiction, where uh, which was developed um, by Kodu Eshwan. Um, as an idea for sort of um, that like music can be like a, a spaceship to, you know, another perspective or another sort of history, an alternate history or an alternate future, mm -hmm. uh, kind of a black Afro futurist um, concept. 
that then was, you know, has been used by a lot of different sound artists to kind of think through ideas of how sound suggests, you know, concepts like Sun Ra, Sun Ra's orchestra and different things. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, Rolf, if you're familiar with those, but I thought maybe that would make sense for what you're also researching. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, sound art is is really fascinating because, as, as you suggested, you know, it combines. For one thing, it combines visual presence with 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 sound, with 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 sonic resonance or with with auditory resonance. Um, by the way, I, I I prefer the term auditory in in, in my own work. Uh, because for, for me, it is basically a phenomenological experience of the subject. Mm -hmm. Of course, it comes materially, as Shelley pointed out very well, materially, it comes from an, an object or other people or so. But um, I think it's, it's interesting to sort of focus on the, on the, on the subjective side, subjective, subjective, both in the sense of you know, personal feelings or so, but also in the sense of the, of the phenomenological subject. And um, I think in sound art, we see this, this sort of interaction. There is a installation that is physically there in time and space, and it, it can be seen and it can be heard and it can be, you know, touched possibly, but, but the experience doesn't begin or the effects don't begin until the subject experiences it. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Then do you work also with sonic fiction, the concept, Rolf? Yeah, a little bit. I'm, I'm, I'm very good friends with, with Holger Schulze and, mm -hmm. and, and he of course has written one of the um, really fundamental sort of in introductions to, to sonic fiction um, mm -hmm. in, Anya, you will know a couple of years ago, not, not too recently. But recently, I think it was published last year, maybe. I'm not I think so, yeah, yeah this very recent. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a very, very good, concise um, book. And, and since, since we are talking about sonic fiction, I'm interested in it, especially because of, because of his style, because when you read it, it is on the one hand, it's a scholarly book. I mean, it has footnotes and citations and, you know, and arguments, but it really develops a totally new language a very sort of poetic, radically avant-garde language that is sometimes formidably difficult, at, at least for me to understand. But that is of course part of the part of the strategy, presumably that he wants to sort of open up not just new areas of sound experience, but new areas of of talking about sound. And mm -hmm. um, I, I think Shelley, you mentioned it, uh, and, and, and we have been talking about that yes, we hear something or we see something or we feel something, the, the vibrations, but they don't make sense to us until sometimes very belatedly, we try to verbalize what we heard. Mm -hmm. So I think Shelley, I think you, you, you make an extremely important point. Primer, primarily um, the physical material vibration, that's, a, that's the primary sensation, right? That mm -hmm. comes first and that's sort of, immediate or at least we feel it's immediate um, but then when we think about it and if we write sort of fictions about it that is very belatedly but it's necessary in order to make sense of what what the vibration gave us or the, what the resonance were and I'm sort of interested in that gap between the the, the immediacy of vibration and the sometimes very belated um, verbal reflection, the conceptualization that that sets in, mm -hmm. and that's where where that's where the sonic fiction takes place. Actually, in between these two poles, so to speak. Uh huh. Yeah, and vibration in a way is the raw thing. I sometimes I was fast. One of the things I was fascinated with was vibrations that are in between what you can sense as vibratory and what then collapses into a single tone say um so you're the the vibrations is almost this raw physical thing that is trans is, is kind of transformed in, in our sensory experience into I mean, many other things 
but there's that tension sometimes when you can do both you can feel that actual vibration that constitutes another kind of sensation there's a whole chapter where I talk a lot about um the, the railway vibrations sort of blurring into one and you lose count of those vibrations I wonder if there's something in that moment of when both are there at the same time that I'm, I'm still fascinated by even yeah. ten minutes later. <laughs> Well, we also, I hope you don't mind uh, the new members who are joining us today for the first time or the members of this session, but we sometimes call our reading group also the reading and rambling group because everyone's free to um, talk about what they have to think about. So I'm rambling maybe now <laughs> if I, what I would like to say, hope you don't mind, but I'm also thinking about this interesting phenomena listening to you, uh, Shelley and also Rolf, um, that a lot of musicians and composers, and especially I'm thinking here like Sun Ra and uh, Karl-Heinz Stockhausen, they had a very strong affinity also to outer space and to alien experience. So as both um, composers claimed, um, San Ra claimed he was, I think, kidnapped by aliens and uh, Karl-Heinz Stockhausen claimed he was born on another planet called Sirius. And I'm wondering if there is also something to the um, sensory experiences of the vibrations of sound or free jazz or electronic music that is so mind opening or like a drug um, um, how do you say yeah um, such an experience that it reaches out even to outer space or to the infinite infinite I don't know if you uh, see their uh, um, um, connection to or can follow my ramblings or my associations yeah I'm not sure um, <laughs> <laughs> not really probably. I didn't know that about either of those okay yeah yeah. Well, because it is, I think it isn't, I was told by another scholar, uh, well, a friend told me from another friend who says that a lot of musicians often have um, these connections to the supernatural, so to speak, composers to the supernatural, and which could, of course, be um, yeah, aliens, but also spiritual experiences, probably because of the subtlety of the beauty of the sounds and the, their vibrations, maybe that there is this also, as you said, the nervous, the idea of people being very nervous. What was it in the 19th century and very open to um, vibrations and, and meaning or something? Yeah, like con concepts like sensibility or yeah and um, being very yeah. nervous and, yeah yeah and it seems that perhaps that's continuing through those composers this sense that they're particularly sensitive to those vibrations mm -hmm. I suppose there is that you are composing vibrations you're composing mm -hmm. in an incredible way in incredible detail um, and it does have in incredibly powerful effects on us doesn't it that goes beyond the palpable and um, even though that's there in, in orchestral halls and orchestral music as well sometimes it's really powerful palpable feeling but there's a lot more going on at the high end where that's yeah something else completely mm -hmm. I don't think I have words for I suppose that's the whole point it's <laughs> it's non-linguistic experience isn't it that takes you somewhere else mm -hmm. and that yeah and that might even also as as we say this room for the imagination or where you struggle with the uncopable so to speak or this experience of the one of something that is so hard to find words and images for yeah and, and so hard to contain I mean I sometimes avoid listening to music because I can't bear it it's too it's too I suppose I'm one of those sensitives <laughs> it's, it's too beautiful or too sad or just too overwhelming mm -hmm. um, yeah I, I haven't written much about music at all, actually, even though that's kind of the origins of, of it or my interest in music. But I got so into vibrations that music got a bit lost. But yeah, I'd be really interested to kind of return to music, perhaps in future work. But you mentioned that you were a, a member of a band in back in Cornwall, too. Or what instrument did you play? What did you do there? Um, I played guitar and flute and I sung. Um, but it was a very long time ago. I've only recently got my hands on a flute again. <laughs> so I'm, I'm yet to get it out of the box. So I don't even know if I can play it anymore. 
<laughs> um, it, but it was actually my PhD that took away so I was still pursuing music at the time but I felt maybe I'm quite an obsessive person or maybe it's the nature of this kind of work but I felt I could only do one and, and it went in the PhD direction mm -hmm. but um, yeah I was wholly dedicated to music before that mm -hmm. maybe I'll have another <laughs> but well, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, Jenny was also a band or in several bands, Jenny. Huh? Were you playing the guitar too? And does your interest in energies and vibrations come from there too? <laughs> I don't know. May I, maybe. Um, I mean, I think probably just also just, yeah, experiencing what sounds do within subcultures, whether it be loud bass or just some other aspect of sounding together I think like there is a dynamic that happens um you know from a scientific perspective I think they do you know there are endorphins that are released when you sing together you know there's a lot of that so I think yeah um, that's right. and also Anya you're working with this in terms of you know groups of people in protest movements you know and that the so sound that plays a role mm -hmm. in expressing and feeding into that um mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, that's what I'm um, very interested in the um, kind of, that was interesting. I was doing field research in uh, Copenhagen at the um, global climate strike. And I was um, observing the demonstrators and um, listening and recording their um, battle cries or their, their singing together and um, observing the kind of energy that was created through this means of making sounds together, noise and uh, music. And then afterwards, I was talking to some of these um, yeah, school kids It's mainly female school kids, actually, and um, their teenage years, around 15 or something, 14. I think they were like 14 to 16, the young uh, women I was talking to. And um, yeah, two of them, they said like how much this um, event was important for them, how much it touched them and how strongly they experienced it because of the energy that was set free. And mm -hmm. also this movement together and the experience of community, not in a subcultural club in front of the Danish parliament in this case, but it was also about setting free a certain kind of energy with the helps or the means of sound and um, We also, I also talked to them and talked about a little bit uh, with them about the struggles of depression that they often have to face when they, um, before they start to engage in climate activism, because they are depressed by the reality of our contemporary life and the problems of um, climate change um, that their generation and future generations will be facing. And that this way of organizing together and making noise and sound together and experience um, them as an energy that makes them move again, helps them to overcome depression. So I think that is what I find um, interesting or how I see a relationship also from sound and energies and climate change, what I'm interested in was my research project, Sounding Crisis. Um, but um, I was originally also thinking, or I'm still thinking, I'm, I'm in the middle of researching at the moment and I'm going in various directions and I'm very much also interested in this spiritual um, dimension you already mentioned, um, um, Shelley, or we talked about, um, is especially doing now and hopefully soon field research in Greenland and in Australia, talking to indigenous people, hopefully. I hope I hope I will manage and learn from them for about their um, yeah, human nature relationship and the role that sound and energies play in there. And as I mentioned, you are also part of the climate change uh, or climate network at your university and you are yourself following on um, environmental uh, issues. I think in your research, do you see the connection to also your book on vibrations? 
backgrounds and your earlier research or where how has your own interest developed towards the direction of environmental issues? Yeah, interesting. Um, I think it again, it's, it, it started from quite a different place, but then I start backtracking and, and looking at connections. But yeah, my, my interest, in, interest in environmental issues came out of, yeah, just concern, to put it mildly, um, about the future and the present and yeah, what, yeah, what's going on. Um, so uh, I touched on it earlier a bit, like with my, actually it was my first book, it was an edited collection, um, Place Writing and Voice in Oral History, where um, I talk about, um, oh yeah, that was it. So it's an area in Cornwall, the mining, where there's a lot of mining goes on and the environmental destruction going on, um, just to that local environment and how the people who work in the mining industry accept that because it's their livelihood. Um, so I was exploring that. So it was quite distinct, really. It was just a different project, an oral history project. Um, but when you were talking earlier, actually, about, about the collectivity of, of, of kind of sonic experience and, and voice, I was thinking one thing I, I is actually this is my, my new book that will be out, I think, later this year. Um, that literary kinds of authorship are very singular usually. Traditionally, a, an author sits down, writes the book, a reader reads it undercover or wherever. So it's very solitary at both ends. It's not usually a collective experience. Um, and yet I think academics have sometimes had very ambitious ideas about what that can do. And, and But yeah, it seems to me that oral history and, and sonic forms have more potential sometimes to be collective at both ends. So um, oral history, for example, well, a project that I want to do uh, um, is find out what kinds of literature might motivate people to take environmental action. So I was going on the school strikes with my kids because I'm like, why isn't everyone everywhere doing this? <laughs> like, this is surely essential action. And so I became fascinated what made me do that and not everyone else who I consider to be sensible people, but why do they not see that this is more important than taking your kids to school? And in fact, why are you potentially disapproving of me taking my kids out? Anyway, so I got very interested in, in what kinds of literature, what kinds of reading make people care. And for me, it might just be some newspaper articles or something. Um, but actually I've become, so I want to do oral history interviews with environmental activists and ask, what did you read? Is, does reading help at all? In fact, can literature, can nature writing stop you doing anything? Because you could take a kind of solitary comfort or escape from that eco anxiety by reading about forests and lakes and your solitary, usually male hero going into the mountains. What and the eco-criticism has traditionally thought this will make people care about the environment, but where's the, does it? <laughs> like, or does it make actually um, people retreat in some ways? So I got interested in that, but I'd like to do an oral history collection where you actually bring together a kind of chorus of voices and people talking about that with the literature that might actually make the contribute to action. And so, yeah, I kind of, I'm interested in collective productions of texts that may involve voice and literature and, and what that, how that might be collectively received as well. So I'm, I'm thinking about some events in the autumn.